This is lesson number four lecture. It focuses on chapter four from our textbook. Chapter four is about defenses to criminal culpability. In a criminal trial, the burden of proof is upon the prosecutor. The prosecutor must prove all elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is variously defined throughout the law, but one general definition is that the, a reasonable doubt is the kind of doubt that would make a person pause before they decide. So for instance, if you were a juror in a criminal trial and you were asked, is the defendant guilty? And you had to think for a few seconds before you answered yes, then even though you answered yes, the answer should really be no because that pause was likely a reasonable doubt. You had to think about your decision. It wasn't an immediate yes. It was something that caused you to hesitate. And that hesitation was probably reasonable doubt. Well, creating a reasonable doubt is a general defense to every criminal defendant. So it's available in every case under all circumstances. So as long as the defendant creates a reasonable doubt, the defendant should be found not guilty. In a criminal case, the defendant is presumed to be innocent. Now I know in practice, jurors may have their own beliefs and jurors may believe at the beginning of the trial that the defendant is actually guilty until proven innocent, but that's not officially what the presumption is. The presumption is that the defendant is innocent and will remain innocent until the prosecution proves beyond a reasonable doubt that they are in fact guilty. This is how someone can appear to be guilty but still be found not guilty by a criminal jury. The prosecution, as we said, has the burden of proving all elements of the offense. The judge and the jury are supposed to be the objective referees who, presuming innocence, sift through the evidence until guilt is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Now this definitely tips the scales heavily in favor of the defendant. With reasonable doubt, we're making the prosecution prove the case with 90%, 95%, maybe even higher degree of certainty. So that means the defendant only has to cre create a tiny doubt, a reasonable doubt, in order to win the case. Why do we do this? Because it's a basic principle in our law that we're more concerned about convicting the innocent than letting the guilty go free. A famous quote is, it's better to let 10 guilty people go free than to convict an innocent person. There are various general types of defenses. The two major categories that we typically see in the criminal law are excuses and justifications. With an excuse defense, we focus on the defendant and we say that there is something about the defendant that makes them blameless. The most common example of an excuse defense would be insanity. Because the person is insane and has little control over what they're doing because of their mental illness, we do not want to hold them responsible for their actions. It's as, it's as if they are not in control of their body. Their illness is in control of their body, so we should not hold them responsible. So we're not saying that their actions are correct. So if someone who is legally insane goes out and kills another person, we're not saying that that was a justified killing. What we are saying is the person, the defendant, should be blameless in that situation because they didn't really have control over what they were doing. Another example of an excuse defense is infancy. This is when someone is too young to be held responsible. Now the age varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but if we had, for instance, a five-year-old who killed someone, even if we thought that five-year-old was a really, really bad kid, we wouldn't hold them criminally responsible because we would assume that that five-year-old 
was not capable of forming criminal intent, did not fully understand their actions, and therefore should not be held criminally responsible. So again, with an excuse defense, there's something about the defendant that makes them blameless. Justifications, on the other hand, focus on the action. And here, we typically say that the actor chose the lesser of two evils. So, as our PowerPoint says, normally the act would have been criminal, but it was justified in this particular situation. So, for example, self-defense is a common justification defense. With self-defense, what we're saying is that if you use force in self-defense, even lethal force, so if you kill someone in self-defense, we are going to justify that killing because your choices were to do nothing and be killed yourself or to protect yourself and our belief is that a person should be allowed to protect themselves even to the point of killing another person. So if you're confronted with deadly force, you may use deadly force in response. We'll learn more about self-defense in just a few PowerPoint presentations, but it's a justification defense because we say you were justified in taking that action. Society has made a determination that in, under those circumstances, you were correct in the way you acted. Even though normally we would say, for instance, that killing is wrong, a justified killing is a killing in which we say you were correct to use lethal force and to kill someone in that situation. So excuses, we focus on the person. Justifications, we focus more on the actions. Most specific defenses are affirmative defenses. An affirmative defense is one in which the defendant carries the burden of production. In a criminal trial, there are different types of burdens or responsibilities. The burden of production is a burden which says who, which asks, I should say, the burden of production asks which of the parties has the responsibility of raising this particular issue at trial. And so with affirmative defenses, we say that the defendant has the burden of at least raising the defense, of making it an issue at trial, or else it'll be assumed that it is not at issue. So for instance, if the defendant plans to plead insanity, the defendant must raise the insanity, insanity defense, must make the court aware that they plan to argue insanity. Otherwise, we it will not become part of the trial. So if we get to the end of the trial and the defendant says, ha-ha, the prosecution never proved that I was sane, the defense will not win because the defense had the burden of production to actually raise the insanity defense, to raise self-defense, to raise necessity, coercion, all of the different defenses that we're going to talk about in this chapter. The burden of persuasion, on the other hand, concerns who has the responsibility for actually proving the issue. Now, if we're talking about raising or presenting criminal charges in a court, then the prosecution has the burden of production. The, the prosecution must bring the charges to the court. They must come in and say, we accuse so-and-so of murder. The prosecution also has the burden of persuasion. They must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that so-and-so actually committed the murder. But with affirmative defenses, we may shift the, both of those burdens to the defense. The defense may have to, as we just said, well not may have to, will have to raise the issue of the defense, and they will also oftentimes have to prove the defense as well. So the defendant may have to not only raise the issue of insanity, but may also have to prove that they're legally insane. So once again, for an affirmative defense, the defendant carries the burden of production and oftentimes also carries the burden of persuasion. So if the defendant does not raise the defense and, is, and if it's an affirmative defense, then it does not become an issue at trial and the defendant 